Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Shapiro, for your warm introduction and for welcoming me and inviting me back to, to Yale to deliver this year's uh, George Herbert Walker, Jr. lecture. Um, in my remarks this afternoon, I propose to consider the modern development of the laws relating to armed conflict. In that, conf in that context, what I want to do is to devote special attention to the, to the areas of universal jurisdiction, proportionality, equality, and complementarity. The development of the laws of armed conflict during the past two decades has been dramatic. Those laws have an ancient heritage, and they were largely based on reciprocity. The law of armed conflict, simply put, was, the, was really the embodiment of the idea between warring nations that if you look after my civilians and prisoners of war, I will reciprocate and look after yours. If you ill-treat mine, don't complain if we ill-treat yours. In the modern era, where the enemy may not reciprocate the rights and benefits of the law of armed conflict, it is a moral authority to be gained or maintained by complying with the law of armed conflict that should be, uh, that should be stressed. This reciprocity really has uh, come to, came to an end with the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Um, the US forces, for example, do not necessarily follow the law of armed conflict for the sake of reciprocity, but do so for what such actions may say about the United States, its values, and its military. Since the end of the 19th century, a large and impressive body of laws have been designed to restrain armies from attacking civilians without military justification. At the very heart of those laws lies the principle of proportionality. In armed conflict, civilians are to be protected unless the military advantage is such that the loss of civilian lives is proportionate to that advantage. And that's a difficult, that's a difficult issue. How do you compare and measure, on the one hand, military advantage, and on the other, the lives of innocent civilians, children, women, and men? But a war crime is committed under modern humanitarian law if civilians are attacked disproportionately. This proportionality test has become a part of customary international law and is not contested by any state. The comparison, as I've said, is frequently a difficult one to make, and especially in the heat of battle during the conduct of wars. And that is why the law, but that is what the law requires. In times of war, a margin of appreciation is given to the armed forces. Thus, in the absence of intent or a high degree of negligence, it is assumed that military action is proportionate. Until comparatively recent times, violations of the laws of armed conflict could only be committed by governments. They did not attract criminal sanctions. It was really a code to be, to be adhered to and obeyed by government forces and governments. That changed during the course of the 20th century. And the idea that criminal liability should accompany serious violations of the laws of armed conflict gained currency. It was really in the shadow of the Holocaust that the first serious attempt was made to hold political leaders and their military commanders criminally responsible for crimes committed by those subject to their command. Winston Churchill famously believed that those evil leaders, and particularly the Nazi leaders, were not entitled to defend themselves, and that they should be put up against a wall and summarily executed. It was, however, prim primarily at the insistence of the United States and the then Secretary for Defense, Henry Stimson, that the Nazi leaders were offered the opportunity of defending themselves at Nuremberg. That was the birth of modern humanitarian law, by which name the laws of armed conflict became known. There are a number of important legacies from Nuremberg. Perhaps the most important is the recognition of a new species of crime called crimes against humanity. The idea was that some crimes are so egregious so huge 
and so shocking to the minds of decent people that they are regarded as being crimes not against only the victims or the people of the country concerned, but crimes against all of humankind. And this really was the birth of universal jurisdiction. It followed that if crimes have an international character, that the courts of any country representing humankind have the right, if not the obligation, to bring such persons to justice. There is, in other words, universal jurisdiction for such crimes. Until Nuremberg, that jurisdiction was recognized out of necessity only for piracy. The first appearance of universal jurisdiction in an international treaty is to be found in the Geneva Conventions of that year. The most serious violations of the Geneva Conventions were named grave breaches, the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. And those nations that have recognized and, and ratified the Geneva Conventions have obliged themselves to investigate and to prosecute and punish people who are found guilty of committing crimes against humanity, no matter where committed. Uh, there is truly universal jurisdiction for such crimes. And it's important in this regard to bear in mind that the Geneva Conventions are the first international conventions, and thus far the only international convention, that have been ratified by every single nation in the world. There's not a member of the United Nations that hasn't ratified the Geneva Conventions and therefore committed themselves to police and to prosecute uh, people who commit these violations. This use of universal jurisdiction was followed in the Apartheid Convention of 1973 and the Torture Convention of 1984. The Apartheid Convention, unfortunately in my view, was effectively ignored and there wasn't one single prosecution under the Apartheid Convention. Had there been, it could well have been that Apartheid in my country could have come to an end a decade before it did. It was, however, the Torture Convention that, that made a difference, and that arose from the very unexpected arrest of General Pinochet in 1998 in a London clinic at the request of a Spanish prosecutor Law professors wouldn't have set that as, a, as an examination hypothetical. It was so out of the ordinary that a head of, former head of state would be arrested in England at the request of Spain for crimes committed in Latin America almost 20 years before. But that ushered in a new, a new situation uh, in respect of suspected war criminals. Um, the, the fact that he wasn't transferred to Spain because of ill health in the view of the then uh, 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 British government didn't detract in any way from the effect of that, uh, of that event. Um, provision for universal jurisdiction has, has become much wider. And there have been now 13 international conventions, UN conventions, designed to combat international terrorism, dating back from the 70s. And all of those conventions provide for universal jurisdiction. And they do that in order to preclude any alleged terrorist from finding a haven in any particular country. All countries are obliged by, the, by these conventions, and they've been widely ratified, to, to, to prosecute alleged terrorists. Since the Pinochet affair, other domestic courts, other than England, have used universal jurisdiction in pursuing persons suspected of committing international crimes. These include suspected Bosnian war criminals, Rwandan genocidaires, Argentine torturers, and the former dictator of Chad, Hassan Habre. And most recently, and very controversially, an English judge issued the warrant of arrest against the former Israeli foreign minister, Tsipi Livni, for alleged complicity in war crimes that might have been committed during the attack on the Gaza Strip just over a year ago. In short, it has become a great deal more hazardous for those suspected of committing international crimes to travel abroad. And this is, this is having an effect on all continents. That's the one legacy of Nuremberg. 
A second important legacy was the recognition of command responsibility under which commanders are held criminally responsible for war crimes committed under their command. And I would stress commanders, not only military commanders, but also civil, uh, civilian political leaders. It is accompanied by the denial of head of state immunity. These developments play a central role in current prosecutions against heads of state and former heads of state and their political and military leaders. In many, in, it, it, it may come as a surprise to you as it did to me when I read recently in a very well-researched book that between January 1990 and May of 2008, in domestic and international court, 67 heads of state or former heads of state and government from, 40, from, 40, from 43 nations have been formally charged or indicted on serious criminal offences. The charges have been pretty much evenly divided, uh, divided between human rights violations and corruption crimes, and, and it, sh it shouldn't come as a surprise that many of these leaders uh, have, been, have been prosecuted for both. And the two so often go together, the corruption and the violation of human rights. I now turn from the developments relating to the jurisdiction of domestic courts to the establishment of international criminal courts. After what was seen in the West as a success of the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, it was assumed at the end of the 1940s that there would be a permanent international criminal court. And one finds express reference to that in the, in the, in, uh, in the Genocide Convention to which I've referred uh, and also in the Apartheid Convention of 1973. Unfortunately, it was the Cold War that put to sleep for almost half a century the idea of an international criminal court. It was one of the effects of the Cold War. And it was only revived after the end of the Cold War, mainly at the behest of the United States under the leadership in that respect of Madeleine Albright, uh, that, that, the, the, that in the light of the events in the Balkans uh, in the early 90s led the United States to, to encourage, uh, together with Western European support, to encourage the Security Council of the United Nations to establish the first ever truly international criminal court, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And that was... The, that was done in 1993. Uh, it did so under powers conferred under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations that authorised the Security Council to, to pass peremptory resolutions binding all member states. It may do so when it, is when it has determined that a particular situation constitutes a threat to international peace and security. That determination was made in respect of the former Yugoslavia and the Security Council decided that it had the power to set up an international criminal court as a tool for peacekeeping. It was that essential link that was made that gave the Security Council the jurisdiction to do that. It made a direct link between justice and peace. As I've said, it's highly unlikely that that, that, that would have happened without the encouragement of the United States, and I would add, it would not have happened if these events had not taken place in Europe. There was no suggestion of the Security Council setting up a similar court for Saddam Hussein when he committed genocide against the Kurds. There was no suggestion of a similar tribunal being set up against Pol Pot when he killed uh, uh, some millions of his own people in Cambodia. It was in Europe, and that led to this dramatic development. And when there was the Rwanda genocide, the precedent had been set, and it, the, the United Nations Security Council could hardly refuse a request from an African country to do what it had done for a European country. But the leaders of Serbia, in respect of the Yugoslavia tribunal, rejected the legality and the jurisdiction and the morality of the Yugoslavia tribunal. They regarded this as representing an act of discrimination against their people. This complaint came to my attention when soon after I took office as the Chief Prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal 
I decided it was appropriate and politic for me to pay a courtesy visit to the three capitals of the former Yugoslavia, Belgrade, Zagreb and Sarajevo. And my first meeting was with the Minister of Justice in, in, uh, in Belgrade. And he expressed his government's strongest objection to the tribunal. He criticised what he called the biased role of the United States in having the Security Council establish that tribunal. He pointed out that the United Nations had not considered setting up tribunals in the other situations to which I've referred. And he referred to some horrible situations in Africa. Um, and he referred especially to Pol Pot and Saddam Hussein. He said, why was the first tribunal established to put Serbs on trial? This was, he has said, unacceptable, an act of discrimination and partiality. Of course he had a point. The only response I could make, without much confidence, I recall, was that uh, if this tribunal was the first and last international criminal tribunal, he was absolutely correct and it was unacceptable. It would be treating the former Yugoslavia exceptionally. But I said if others were to follow, then Serbia had no good reason to complain because it happened to be the first. Little did I know that there would soon in the next year be a tribunal for Rwanda, and little did I know that in a very few years after that there would be a permanent international criminal tribunal and international courts for Sierra Leone, uh, uh, East Timor, and now uh, Lebanon and Cambodia. In more recent years, in the wake of the first situations to come before the International Criminal Court, other complaints have emerged along similar lines from some African countries and the African Union. They point to the fact that the four situations before the International Criminal Court are all African situations. And they say, why has the world, led by the West and the Northern countries, set up a tribunal aimed at, at, at looking only at war crimes committed uh, in Africa. Of course, the complaints without merit and unfair because none of the four situations were determined by the court itself. Three of them were referred by heads of state of the African countries concerned, Uganda, the Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the fourth, in the respect of Sudan, was referred by the Security Council of the United Nations. That is, to, to blame the court for having chosen those four situations uh, is a little unfair. But regardless of the absence of justification for those complaints from the government of, of Serbia, the African Union, and some of the members and, and some of the members of the AU, they teach an important lesson which I think should be taken into account. In order for any system of justice, whether domestic or international, to have credibility and to gain acceptance, there has to be both the fact and the perception that the system is fair and equal in its application. I need hardly emphasize to an American audience the importance of equality in the context of justice. The experience of this country with regard to the abolition of slavery and the civil rights movement make any further comments unnecessary. What requires our attention is that the concept of equality is closely related to human dignity. If some people are treated with greater favour, if some are given greater rights and benefits, the dignity of those denied is infringed and violated. The greater the differentiation, the greater is the invasion of dignity. In any nation, all citizens demand quite rightly to be treated equally. It is that denial of equality and the human dignity of victims that lies at the root of most, if not all, of serious human rights violations. Without dehumanizing the victims, such egregious crimes would be impossible to commit. There can be no wanton killings, rapes and torture of those regarded as equals. It is those crimes that form the main body of international crimes in modern humanitarian law, modern criminal law. Many of them are to be found in widely adopted treaties to which I've referred earlier, and especially the Genocide Convention, the grave breach provisions of the, of the Geneva Convention, the Torture Convention, and more recently, the Anti-Terrorist Con uh, Conventions. 
It is the investigation and prosecution of those crimes that are, that are attracting the attention of both international and domestic prosecutors in more and more countries. I have no doubt that our world would be a better and more peaceful one if all nations recognised and applied the norms and principles contained in the Charter of the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Again, I refer to the key norm of equality. It is a matter for regret, I would suggest, that in international affairs, inequality, rather than equality, is just about the rule, rather than the exception. Trade preferences, the select club of nations that are deemed entitled to possess nuclear weapons, which nations may veto resolutions of the Security Council, and more, impor uh, more important for present purposes, which nations are not questioned when they violate the fundamental rights of their people or of other people. There is, we must, we must accept, one law for powerful nations and a different law for the weak. It is disappointing that the United States, the leading power of the world, joins with other large nations such as Russia and China in refusing to be judged on the same basis that Americans have always held should apply to other nations. This desire by the United States to be treated on an exceptional basis reached its height during the administration of President George W. Bush. It was perhaps best exemplified by the approach to the International Criminal Court. In this regard, it is somewhat ironic that it was the United States, and especially Madeleine Albright, <coughs> then permanent representative to the United Nations, that led the efforts, uh, that led the efforts of the Security Council, as I've mentioned, to establish the Yugoslavia and the Rwanda tribunals and it was primarily at her urging that the International Criminal Court came about. The signing of the Rome Treaty by President Clinton in December of 1999, right at the end of his, uh, his term of office, was almost ceremoniously unsigned on behalf of President Bush by John Bolton. He infamously stated that his communication to the Secretary General of that unsigning made it the happiest day of his career. The Bush administration took extraordinary steps to avoid the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. It threatened to veto extensions of the mandate of UN peacekeepers in Bosnia and Herzegovina unless the Security Council expressly granted uh, uh, immunity to the forces of those nations that had not ratified the Rome Treaty and the Security Council had to capitulate. It threatened to veto the reference of the Darfur situation to the International Criminal Court unless nationals of countries that had not ratified the Rome Treaty were not granted similar immunity and, and that they had no obligation to comply with orders of the International Criminal Court. There are many other instances of that kind of conduct, including, I would suggest with respect, the ridiculous legislation authorizing the president to send military forces to rescue any American citizen who might be brought before the International Criminal Court, a, a, a provision that, that earned the, the name of the Hague Invasion Act. <laughs> and you can imagine how popular that was in the Netherlands and elsewhere in Europe. It should be acknowledged that this exceptional approach of the United States is not peculiar to the United States. It is common to the majority of powerful nations. International oversight is approved for the weak, but the powerful are to be exempt from it. It is this failure to lead by example that is retarding a faster development and, more important, the enforcement of international criminal law. By shunning the International Criminal Court, the United States loses the great opportunity to influence the development of the court and international criminal law in general. Despite the measures that were introduced by the Bush administration, the International Criminal Court is moving forward with prosecutions and trials. It's just begun its second trial and, and building upon the growing body of international criminal law. Once the leader of that movement, the United States has relegated itself to the sidelines as other states march forward in prosecuting war crimes. 
and serious violations of international human rights. And we should take into account that the, inter that the International Criminal Court now has uh, the, the act of support through ratification of the Rome Treaty of 110 members of the United Nations, and that includes every single member of the European Union. Claims by nations to, to be exempt from hitherto well-accepted norms of international law have proliferated since the attacks of 9-11. It came as a shock to many in this country that there were secret torture memos, cruel and inhuman treatment of prisoners by US personnel at Abu Ghraib and Bagram prisons, and secret extraordinary rendition of prisoners to countries where they were likely to be tortured. It's in a similar fashion, I would suggest, that the present government of Israel claims that the international laws of armed conflict should be changed to allow disproportionate military responses uh, in order to attack terrorist groups. This should not be regarded as a plea by Israel for the right to take measures in self-defense, for that is not seriously denied Israel. It should also not be regarded as a plea for the right to take military measures Against, mirror, uh, against members of terror groups responsible for such attacks. It can logically only be interpreted as a plea for the right to take measures that are regarded as unlawful under present laws of rules of international law. No reason has been proffered to support that claim, and I would suggest there is not one. From recent media reports in Israel, it would appear that leaders of the Israel Defense Force have come to recognize that the suggested changes to which they have referred in international law are not going to happen. And clearly they can't happen without a wide consensus of the international community. Let me return to where I started. The laws relating to armed conflict requiring proportionality with regard to military action. That means that the number of civilians who stand to be killed or injured by an attack must be justifiable, having regard to the military advantage to be gained by the action. Thus, for instance, if there are three or four terrorists firing rockets from the roof of a hospital containing hundreds of patients, it would not be justifiable or lawful under the rules of law, as I understand them, to bomb the hospital complex. Action taken to take out the terrorists that would cause the death or injury of a small number of civilians, uh, civilian patients, may well be justified, depending on the danger caused by the attacks from the hospital uh, and, the, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the military advantage uh, in, 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 in bringing that to an end. The former, bombing the whole complex, would be a war crime. The latter would not. These, as I've already indicated, are difficult decisions, and especially in what has been aptly called the fog of war. That is why, as I mentioned earlier, the laws grant a margin of appreciation in favor of military commanders who take such decisions. I do not propose this evening to discuss the findings of the UN fact-finding mission on Gaza and will content myself by saying that both Israel and Hamas were found to have launched attacks against civilians in Israel and in Gaza in a manner that constituted war crimes and possibly crimes against humanity. I would emphasize only that there was certainly no denial of Israel's right to defend its citizens from unlawful attacks. Indeed, the criticisms of Israel in the report were based on the lack of proportionality, which assumes a right to take military action. International law makes the exercise of that right effective, notwithstanding the requirement of proportionality. I propose to conclude this examination of the current state of holding war criminals accountable with a short consideration of the modern system called complementarity. This requires that before the International Criminal Court is able to exercise its jurisdiction over the national of any country, the government of that country is entitled and has to be given the opportunity of taking control of the investigation and if there is evidence to support it, any prosecution of that person. If a government does that in good faith, the International Criminal Court simply has no jurisdiction. If the domestic investigation is genuine and not calculated to avoid the jurisdiction of the court, 
then, as I say, the court loses jurisdiction in that case. This system of complementarity is designed to ensure that whenever possible, suspected war criminals should be investigated and tried by the courts of the suspect's own nation. This has a number of advantages. One is that in order to exercise the right of complementarity, nations are encouraged to promulgate laws that make international crimes part of their own criminal law. Clearly, a country cannot exercise its right of complementarity if its courts can't investigate and can't prosecute the crimes in question. And many of the countries that have, that have ratified the Rome Treaty have changed their laws to incorporate these international crimes and so enable them to do their own investigations uh, should, should they become relevant and necessary. Another advantage of the system of complementarity is that alleged criminals would be tried under the laws of their own nations, and that's appropriate. A third, and from the perspective of the United States, probably the most important advantage, is that nationals of countries willing and able to conduct good faith investigations and prosecutions of their own nation nationals preclude the International Criminal Court from exercising its jurisdiction over them. And it's ironic, really, because this system of complementarity really came about as a result of the, the, the push from the United States that there should be that protection to, to national systems over their own nationals, over their own citizens. It was in the light of this system of complementarity that the UN fact-finding mission on Gaza recommended that Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas conduct their own credible and public investigations into the allegations contained in the report. The recommendation was supported by both the State Department and the European Union. Hamas responded to the effect some months ago that they were considering such an investigation, but nothing appears to, to, to have manifested itself uh, or materialized in consequence of that announcement. Last week, there were calls from a coalition of leading Palestinian human rights groups for both Hamas and the Palestinian Authority to launch such, to, to launch such domestic investigations into violations of international law identified in the Gaza report. And, and the Gaza report made serious findings of human rights and international law violations, both, both, in, uh, both, uh, both uh, perpetrated uh, in the Gaza Strip uh, and on the West Bank. On Monday of this week, uh, the Palestinian Authority announced that it, that it had set up a five-member committee uh, to look into the alleged human rights violations by its security forces in the West Bank. And those, the, those violations include uh, assassinations, murder, and torture. And it, according to news reports this last weekend, Israel has completed a military investigation of alleged war crimes committed by its forces during Operation Cast Lead. Whether this will be followed by an independent inquiry, an open inquiry, is apparently still being debated by the government of Israel. In the last 48 hours, conflicting statements have been made by members of the present Israeli cabinet. It is certainly my hope that Israel will indeed launch a credible independent inquiry. And let me say that in no way should this be seen, and it's been billed, I think, unfortunately, as a rebuttal of the Gaza report. I would have thought that the Israeli government and the Israeli army would have regarded it to be their legal and moral duty to investigate allegations of a serious nature uh, made, made, made in consequence of the war. To regard this as a rebuttal suggests that there wouldn't be these investigations but the report of the Gaza Commission, and I don't believe that that reflects well uh, on the policy of the Israeli government and military. The military investigating allegations against themselves behind closed doors hardly satisfies international norms and criteria, and their conclusions, even if made public, would bring no meaningful justice to the many victims of Operation Cast Lead. Israel regards itself as a democracy and should, I would suggest, not complain if it is judged by the standards expected of democratic nations that uphold the values of the rule of law. 
If it takes military action to defend its citizens from unlawful attacks, it has no excuse for not abiding by the rules of international law. That its enemy does not do so also affords it no excuse for its own alleged unlawful behaviour. Let me conclude by saying that international law will not be fully effective unless and until all nations of the world are prepared to respect and implement it. If there was universal ratification of the Rome Treaty, if every member of the international community uh, ratified the Rome Treaty and worked for the International Criminal Court, it would, of course, become wholly unnecessary for any domestic court to exercise universal jurisdiction. And that would be a good situation. I think it's inappropriate for domestic courts to set themselves up as international courts and get involved in situations that have nothing to do with those countries. If there was universal acceptance of the International Criminal Court, that need would disappear immediately. All alleged war crimes would be amenable to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. The future of international justice depends upon the International Criminal Court and the system under which it operates achieving wide credibility. That is not likely to happen without the full support of the United States of America. Its example is paramount, and many of the nations that are still outside the tent would, I feel confident, follow the example and ratify the Rome Treaty if there was a push in that direction from this powerful nation. The question that faces the international community, and especially the United States, is whether we will have a better world in which all war crimes are credibly and efficiently investigated and those guilty of war crimes prosecuted and appropriately punished if found guilty, in other words, withdrawing impunity from war criminals. I cannot believe that we would have a better and more peaceful world if we revert to the pre-World War II situation in which war criminals were effectively beyond the reach of justice. If we care about the victims of war crimes and their rightful claims for justice, the solution, I would suggest, is an obvious one. Thank you.